What's up guys, Laura here with STP. I have been a test prep coach with 18 years experience and I scored a 1590 on the digital SAT. I'm here with another predictions video, this time for the September SAT. I'm so excited to give you guys my top 10 predictions in both the English and the math. And I don't know if you know this, but I'm the first influencer to ever come out with SAT predictions videos. That's right, back in September of 2022, I released my first video and I have been spot on with so many of my predictions ever since. People are telling me I can actually switch professions and become a clairvoyant. So if you're interested in me reading your palm or giving you a tarot card reading, I charge $10 a reading, just comment below and we can set that up. Okay, I'm just kidding. Seriously though, we are going to run through what I think is gonna show up on the September test. And honestly, I would recommend you guys go through the brand new questions that were just released in College Board's question bank as well, because usually when they release new questions and they just released 300 of them, a lot of those question types show up on the test. The problem though is if you go to the question bank, you can't filter to these new questions, don't worry. My team and I already did that for you guys. If you subscribe to our email list at our website, then we will email you the Google Drive link so you can get in and get all the questions so you can do some more practice. I will link up here to our website right now. Head over there, subscribe, and we'll get that out to you as soon as possible. All right, guys, type in the comments section below what you are trying to land on the September test. I would love to hear about your goals and where you're currently at right now in your practices. All right, first, before we get into the tips, this video is brought to you by Preply, the OG digital SAT prep app that's available in the App Store and in Google Play. We have about 1,500 unique questions, both English and the math. So if your phone is an extension of your body and you like the idea of doing 10 to 15 minutes of extra practice each day, head to the Preply app, download that. I will link it up here right now and get some extra reps in before your test. All right, guys, just a heads up, the 10 predictions I have, I put into a doc to share with you all. In the description below is a link to this doc. Go grab that. You can work alongside me, take some notes, try these problems out. I think it'll really help your learning and retention. So let's look at prediction one. I think that they're going to give you a boundaries question on the standard English convention side where one of the answer choices separates two complete sentences. So whenever you're on a standard English convention question, I recommend going to the answer choices first and assessing what they give you. As you can see, there's only one answer here that can separate two complete sentences. The rest cannot, so I already know by default the answer is A. What I would do is flag the question to come back to and read it later if I have extra time and make sure I have two complete sentences. But honestly, this strategy has been foolproof ever since I started using it. All right, my second prediction is a math prediction. I think that they're gonna ask you about displaying as a constant or coefficient. Sometimes they might word it as displayed as a base or a coefficient. And that's just basically fancy SAT speak for saying, hey, what answer has a number in the original equation that's still visible when you get the answer? So essentially, when they talk about x being greater than or equal to zero, what you're gonna do is you're gonna put in zero for x into the answers, and then you're gonna see if it spits out a number that's already visible in the original equation. So when I do the first one, now let me bring it down here, I've got 18 times 1.16, times 1.4, and then it's gonna to be to the zero plus two. Um, so essentially what's gonna happen is I'm gonna square the 1.4, I'm gonna multiply it by 1.16 and multiply it by 18. I'm gonna get a new number. That number is now something that's in the original problem. I'm not getting 18, I'm not getting 1.16, I'm not getting 1.4, so one is out. So I'm gonna cross off any answer choices that say one is an answer. Now let's go to the second one. So if I put in zero for X into the second one, 
I'm going to have to take 1.4 to the fourth power, then multiply that by 18. I'm also going to get a new number that isn't originally visible in the equation. So both of them are out. So the answer is D, neither one nor two. This is what would happen if the answer was right. Let me just show you an, uh, an answer that would work. If they said the function f of x equals 18 times 1.4 to the x, that would work because if you put in zero for x, you have 18 times 1.4 to the zero, which gets you basically 18 times one or 18. So that's a number that was originally visible as a coefficient in the problem. So if that was one of your Roman numerals, you would pick that one. All right, guys, if you're liking this video so far, listen, I come out with free content every single week to help you master the SAT. It doesn't cost you anything to just smash the subscribe button below and also hit the notification bell so you get alerted when I come out with a new video. My third prediction is you will have a lead-in on this test. A lead-in is a grammar question where they basically write a short introduction to what they're gonna be talking about, but they haven't introduced the subject yet. So usually a lead-in will look just like this, where they have a phrase starting out the sentence, then they have you know a comma, and then there's the blank. And then all the answer choices are super long and they kind of look like they're talking about the same thing, but in different orders. Your goal is to figure out what the subject is because the subject needs to come right after the lead-in. And the lead-in talks about the subject. So in this case, the subject is supported by biochemical analysis. So when I go through the answer choices, vegetables and grains aren't going to be supported by biochemical analysis. Uh, diets won't be supported by biochemical analysis. Um, the primary components of the diets won't be supported by biochemical analyses. Findings are what are supported by analyses. So I'm going to pick D. All right, my fourth prediction, and this one is kind of an interesting one because it usually doesn't come up on the SAT. I think you're going to have a unit circle question on your test. Unit circle has just started to resurface. They released a new question to the question bank on unit circle. I heard it was on the June test potentially. So let's talk unit circle. This one says point F lies on a unit circle. Well, first of all, you want to draw an XY coordinate plane to map this out. So let's do that. So point F is at one zero. Okay. Then we have point G is at the center. So here's G. And then they have point H also lies on the circle and it has the coordinates negative one Y. So that means, you know, if we're at negative one, we don't know the y, we're going to be maybe where y is positive up here. That could be h. h could be here, right on the x-axis, if y is zero. Or h could be down here if y is negative. But it's going to be somewhere in the second or third quadrant. So when you go through your answer choices, they said what could be a possible all right, what could be the positive measure of angle FGH? So angle FGH is either going to be in the second or third quadrant. What you guys need to know is if you go all the way around unit circle, that takes two pi radians, right? So we want to just go a little bit, you know, we want to go like halfway around so that we're over here a little bit less than halfway around, exactly halfway around, or a little bit more than halfway around. And I already know that this 25 pi will get us there because it's an odd number of radians. 24 pi is exactly 12 rotations, so we're going to get back to the starting point at the beginning. 25 pi is 12 rotations plus a half. So literally, we're going to end up right here at this point, which is exactly one of the points where y could be zero, and then we have, we're at negative one. The problem with a and b, a is, I think you get 13.5. So you would be a half rotation 
because of the 13 is odd, but then another quarter rotation, you're going to be down here. That's not going to work. And then 29 uh, pi over 2 gets you 14.5, where it's an even number, so you're going to be back at the beginning, and then you're only going to quarter, so you're only going to be up there. That's not going to work. So anyways, D is right. D gets you all the way around 12 times and then halfway around one more time, which puts you at a place where point H can be. All right, guys, if you're finding this video helpful so far, show me some love, hit the like button below. Let's go to question five. All right, my fifth prediction deals with comma placement. Here's a rule that comes up over and over again. If you have a description before the name, you don't need commas. Just know that. So I'm going to look for the one that says linguist Diane Massam, blah, blah, blah. I can read right through that. I don't need any punctuation marks at all. I'm going to go with C. Prediction six deals with perpendicular slope. So what's great about these questions is they said that this is line K and then they said line J not shown is perpendicular. But let's figure out the slope to line K. And you can do that simply by putting it into Desmos and running a linear regression. Or what you can do is you can just count down and over. So if I start here and I go down, because slope is rise over run, if I go from zero down to, it looks like negative five, I'm going down negative five, and then I'm going from negative six to zero, so I'm going over po a positive six because I'm going to the right. So that means the slope of line K is negative five over six. So J, since it's perpendicular, it's going to be the negative reciprocal. So the answer will be six fifths. Another way you can do it, let me just show you the regression way. If you don't like that, or you're afraid you're going to make a mistake. You can just see what the two points are on the line. So here I'm at negative six, zero. Here I'm at um, zero, negative five. I'm going to put those into Desmos. First, I'm going to type in table. I'll put in negative six, zero, and then I'll put in zero, negative five. And then I'm going to hit that button in the top corner, top left corner, and it runs a linear regression for me. The problem is, as you can see, it gives you the slope in um, decimal form. So what you could do is you could type it in and then hit the fraction button. And then see, it gives you negative five, six. So then you just switch it around and it's six fifths. So just be careful about repeating decimals. You're gonna have to type enough of them in so that it will convert it to a fraction properly. All right, prediction seven. I think you're gonna have a subject verb agreement question on your test. So when you look at your answer choices and they're all verbs, use the pronoun trick. You're going to use he and they. If there's a difference between singular and plural tenses, the one that is different is right. So I would say he has entered, they have entered, they were entering, they entered. The answer is going to be A. Prediction A, I think you're going to have an interpreting an equation or an inequality question. So basically they said X is small cheese pizzas. By the way, the 115 is dollars. So that's small cheese pizzas, why is large cheese pizzas? And then they want to know what is the best interpretation of 14 Y? They want you to interpret an entire term. They're not asking for just the 14 or just the Y. They're asking for the entire term 14 Y. So you're going to pick something that says total. And then essentially because the Y deals with large cheese pizzas, go with C. All right, prediction nine, I think you're gonna have an apostrophes question on your test. So with apostrophes, what you can do is you can play majority rules. So when I look at the four options for variables, I notice three of them are the same and one of them is different. This one has an apostrophe with it. So that's a weirdo, I'm gonna get rid of A. Then when I look at all the objects, it looks like these two objects are the same and then these two are different. So I'm gonna get rid of C and D, the answer has to be B. All right, my last and final prediction, I think that you're gonna have a density formula question on your test. 
This is risky for me to predict this because these do not come up that often, but I noticed that they added a new one into the question bank and I just have a feeling it's gonna come up again because it hasn't come up in a while. So it's important that you know that the density equals the mass divided by the volume. If you know that formula, then it's smooth sailing. It's not on your reference sheet, so you have to know that. So when they say the density is 813, you're gonna put that in for D. Then they said the edge has a length of 0.6 meters. So when you get volume of a cube, you do 0.6 cubed. So let's see what that is. 0.216. So I'm gonna basically set that for the V and I'm solving for M because they said, what is the mass? So we just have to multiply both sides by 0.216 and then we'll get our answer. So it looks like it's gonna be 176. I don't even need to put that in Desmos because 488 is more than half, so that would be 0.5 something. That doesn't make any sense. It's gotta be the smallest number that they give you. All right, so there you have it. Those are my top 10 predictions for the September SAT. Comment below with 1600 because since you made it to the end of this video, you are a perfect score in my heart. And I cannot wait to hear how you guys do on the test. Keep me posted. Until next time, happy prepping.